TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem. And in today's top stories, Damascus accuses Jerusalem of launching a cross-border missile strike on a number of targets in southern Syria. The IDF concluded a week-long exercise which took place throughout the country aimed at simulating combat scenarios in order to improve the military's readiness for the next war. The IAEA confirmed that Iran has granted it partial access to the Karaj plant, which is a centrifuge part manufacturing facility, for the purpose of replacing damaged or missing surveillance cameras. Syria has accused Israel of launching a surface-to-surface -surface attack on a number of targets in the southern part of the country last night, claiming the life of one Syrian soldier and causing material damage. According to the regime-run Sana News Agency, quoting a military source, a wave of missiles were launched at 12.50 a.m. overnight from the direction of the Golan Heights, asserting further that Syria's aerial defense systems managed to intercept most of the incoming projectiles. According to the London-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, the alleged Israeli strike targeted a post of Syria's air defense in the south of El Shahba area in the western countryside of El Shaweda. And while one regime soldier was confirmed as killed, the death toll is expected to rise due to the fact that the missile bombardment reportedly wounded others. It is important to note that while Damascus naturally pointed a blaming finger at Jerusalem, the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm or deny its alleged responsibility in response to TV7's request for comment. Meanwhile, in Israel, the IDF concluded a week-long exercise which took place throughout the country aimed at simulating combat scenarios in order to improve the military's readiness for the next war. The exercise was led by the IDF's Technology and Logistics Division in cooperation with the Land Forces, the Operational Division, and Southern Command. IDF Chief of General Staff Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi attended the last day of the drill yesterday, during which he received an overall assessment of the military's preparedness. Subsequently, General Kochavi said he was impressed by the achievements of the exercise including the demonstration of capabilities and high competence in transporting forces and weapons, the division's activities in the areas of deploying the logistics networks and providing combat equipment. He further highlighted the dedication of the troops and emphasized that Israel's defense forces will continue to prepare for a future war at a time when its enemies are persistently lurking throughout the region with malicious intent directed at the Jewish state. אין תחליף לתרגילים. אין תחליף לתרגילים, אין תחליף להקפצות, אין תחליף לבחנים. זה גם לא מקרה שאנחנו מרבים בזה, בכל הממדים ובכל התחומים והנושאים. The IDF is seemingly preparing for an all-out war with the Islamic Republic of Iran. The extensive number of drills which the IDF is continuously simulating aims to raise the level of preparedness to that end after preparations for a full-fledged confrontation were evidently neglected over the past decade, that after UN Security Council Resolution 2231 was adopted, which effectively ratified the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, which is the technical term for the 2015 nuclear agreement. Nevertheless, since Lt. Gen. Aviv Kochavi assumed the role of IDF Chief of General Staff, Preparatory work to bolster Israel's readiness for eradicating the Iranian threat, including its nuclear program and proxies, have been significantly accelerated, with focus on both the defensive and offensive capabilities. And while senior military officials believe that the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran is fundamentally flawed, they regard the agreement as a good way to slow Tehran's nuclear progress down, effectively granting Jerusalem enough time to prepare for what is currently regarded as an inevitable course of collision between the two countries. Meanwhile, according to an IAEA report, which was circulated to members of the Board of Governors, the agency confirmed that Iran has granted it partial access to the Karaj plant, which is a centrifuge parts manufacturing facility 
for the purpose of replacing cameras that were either missing, damaged, or destroyed when the nuclear plant was reportedly subject to an attack in June earlier this year. It is interesting to note that while Iran confirmed that it voluntarily agreed to grant access to the IAEA to avoid misunderstandings, the report indicates that Tehran's reasoning for its decision included an arrangement in which the IAEA will allow Iran to examine a sample camera and provide technical information on it on December 19th, a process that will be done in the presence of IAEA inspectors. An IAEA source who spoke to TV7 on condition of anonymity confirmed that in the past the IAEA has provided member states upon request such information to alleviate security concerns of inspected parties. And while the IAEA further stressed in its report that it continues to work on remaining outstanding safeguard issues, the Islamic Republic is seemingly defiant on any tangible progress, refusing to grant any logical explanation regarding nuclear particles that were found in a number of undeclared locations. It is important to highlight that while the arrangement reached between Iran and the IAEA was referred to by the Ayatollah regime as significant progress, negotiations in the Austrian capital, Vienna, has reached an impasse. Two European diplomats told TV7 that Iran refuses to budge on its prerequisite to have all U.S. sanctions which it regards as related to its nuclear program lifted before making any concession vis-à-vis -vis its nuclear activities. And while the United States, France, Britain and Germany warned the Islamic Republic that its obstinate approach threatens the likelihood of the renewal of the 2015 deal, Moscow and Beijing are backing Tehran's demand since both Russian and Chinese companies are subject to U.S. sanctions for defiantly trading with blacklisted Iranian companies. Consequently, during every public opportunity, Russian and Chinese officials have called for a removal of sanctions of, quote, third parties, in reference to their own blacklisted companies. Meifang一直高喊,多边主义回来了,外交回来了,复谈就是对美方态度的一次检验。美方理应首先取消所有对一及第三方的非法制裁。一则应在此基础上恢复全面履约。the Chinese diplomat who spoke at the session of the UN Security Council deliberating on the so-called JCPOA further accused the United States of not negotiating in good faith, all the while urging it to grant Iran waivers for its oil industry at a time when Beijing continues to procure significant amounts of Iranian oil regardless of US sanctions. Zhong it is interesting to note that while the United Nations Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Rosemary Di Carlo, provided a periodic briefing on Iran's nuclear program, confirming that the Islamic Republic continues to enrich uranium metal, which has little to none civic applications, the world body has evidently adopted the Chinese and Russian narratives, urging the United States to remove sanctions or provide waivers, irrespective of Tehran's nuclear activities. I appeal to the United States to lift or waive its sanctions as outlined in the plan and extend the waivers regarding the trade in oil with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Also important is the extension of U.S. waivers regarding certain civilian nuclear-related activities taking place at the Boucher nuclear power plant, the Fordow facility, and the Arak reactor. We also call on the Islamic Republic of Iran to reverse the steps it has taken 
that are not consistent with its nuclear-related commitments under the plan. In this reporting period, the International Atomic Energy Agency indicated that Iran has continued its research and development activities related to uranium metal production. Thank you for joining us. In light of TV7's Christmas broadcast schedule, TV7 Israel News will cease its productions until January 4th. However, TV7 Israel will continue to broadcast our other programs during the intermediary time, including tomorrow's airing of Powers in Play, amongst other subsequent productions. For more information, please visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com, where you can find an up-to-date broadcast schedule. Until I return from our Christmas vacation, I would like to convey a Merry Christmas and Blessed New Year from Jonathan Hessen, our team, and myself. And until January 4th, keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of Israel. I'm Yair Pinto. Shalom. <laughs>